Hey, what is up, guys? It's Thunderstruck115, and today we are going to be taking a look at a review from everybody's favorite condiment, Under the Mayo. The review in question is about a game that released about a month ago called Trepang 2, which, let me tell you, is a fucking awesome game. And honestly, I think the only games that have released this year that are better are Tears of the Kingdom and possibly Everspace 2, though I haven't decided on that one yet. But in typical Mayo fashion, he loves to contradict himself a lot, as well as just miss the point of a bunch of design decisions, so anyways, let's go ahead and get into this. Trepang 2 is a game I have a lot to say about. Fear, the game it's largely based on, is one of my all-time favorites. I've been anxiously awaiting the release of Trepang 2 ever since the first demo, which I did not play. I saw it, immediately knew it was right up my alley, and decided to wait until it came out. I'm glad I did, because the initial joy of returning to Fear's combat does a lot for this game. If I had already spoiled it by playing the demo, I think I would be less satisfied with it. Because I am kinda unsatisfied. And right off the bat, we already have Mayo contradicting himself. You decided not to play the demo because you thought you'd be dissatisfied, but you ended up being dissatisfied anyway when you waited for the final game? That doesn't make any sense. If anything, wouldn't it be good to play the demo before buying the game so that way you'll know if the game is for you or not? It seems to me you could have saved $30 if that was the case, or at least make a more informed decision when buying the game. It's a bit of a mixed bag, but still a game I ultimately enjoyed, and would recommend. The combat is really good, the guns feel amazing, the effects and graphics and gore are impressive. It's great. I'm not going to get into that stuff too much here though. Instead I want to talk about the core mechanics of Trepang 2 and how great they are when they work and how not great they are when they don't. As I sometimes do, I'm just going to refer you to G-Man's review if you want a more general look at the game. He covers combat, weapons, levels, music, story, interactivity. It's a good review. If that's what you're looking for, that's the video to watch. Here we're going to dig into some specifics that I think hold this game back. With six difficulty settings available, I went with number four. Very hard, just to feel it out. You can actually pick a difficulty before starting each mission, which is quite nice. Disappointingly, there is no information on what difficulty settings affect. Do you take more damage? Are enemies spongier? Are there fewer resources? Is the AI smarter or more aggressive? Do your powers burn out quicker? Who knows, and I'm not going to play on a bunch of different difficulties and spend hours making measurements. Would it have been nice for them to tell you what exactly changed between difficulties? I suppose, but at the same time, I don't really think it's a massive issue when most FPS games out there don't really do that either. They'll usually give you a very general description of how hard to expect it to be, which Trepang 2 does, but most games don't. For example, Fear, Halo, Call of Duty, Wolfenstein, Bioshock, and so on. Alright, at this point he starts talking about what he likes about the game, so I'm just gonna speed past this so we can get to the actual juicy part. However, I'm far less happy with the stamina system because I feel it's confused. I'm not against the game having stamina, I do love the idea of killing enemies giving you a stamina boost, so if you're always in the action, you're never out of stamina. Super cool mechanic. But there's two things that are just killing me. First, there are plenty of sections where there's no combat, in the campaign levels and at the base which is your hub world. There's nothing to do here but run to the mission select screen and run back to the helicopter. That is a straight up lie because there are definitely things to do in the hub area besides selecting your mission. There's a firing range for you to test out different weapons. You can equip whatever weapons you want to bring into the next level. You can equip attachments on your weapons before going into the next level. Provided, of course, that you've unlocked them. There's the combat simulator, which is basically horde mode from Gears of War 2. There's the bounty board showing you the HVT that you've eliminated and which ones you haven't, as well as any difficulty requirements they might have. And you awkwardly run out of stamina on the way. And you awkwardly run out of stamina on the way. Maybe you wouldn't be running out of stamina this often if you just let the bar recharge? Like, in that footage of his, you can see that as soon as he has just the slightest bit of stamina, he'll go ahead and expend it. But you'll probably also know this that the rate at which he regenerates stamina is faster than the rate at which he consumes it. 
In fact, recharging your stamina really isn't all that difficult. Literally, it only takes like a third of a second for it to go back to full, and then you can sprint for a couple of seconds. Now, could they have just removed the stamina mechanic from the hub area since there's no combat there? Yeah, they could have. But it's hard to go without pointing out the fact that Mayo was actively making it worse. As for the sections and levels where there's no combat, that's because it's meant to be a break in the action, usually an opportunity for environmental storytelling, with my favorite example being the Site 83 mission. Maybe the one point where I would agree with Mayo on this is the level Site 32, because there you're given a gas mask, which increases the rate that you consume stamina and reduces your movement speed, which I found kind of annoying. But that's one level in the game, and hell, that level is completely optional. Maybe they could have made stamina something you only deal with in combat scenarios. It reminds me of Nightmare of Decay, where they updated the game to remove stamina from areas you've already cleared to make backtracking less tedious. Yeah, except the problem with that is that with the exception of Site 32, none of the levels in Trepang 2 have any backtracking. At least not in the traditional sense. Now, there are some levels, such as Jorvik Castle, which will loop around back into an arena that you fought in previously, but you're not going back the way you came. And when you do get back to that arena, there's another combat encounter there. Meanwhile, the mid-level sections where there isn't any combat is supposed to get you to slow down. The whole point is to give you an opportunity to take in the environment and give you opportunities for environmental storytelling, and to find optional upgrades such as weapon attachments. Going from actively managing stamina in combat to constantly suffering from its limitations when not in combat is what makes the whole thing feel confused. And the second point is that there's a horrible, horrible bug where if you press left or right with the run key and then press forward, you don't run. I'll break this down a bit for you. You cannot strafe run, which is fine, but you can run forward into the side by pressing both a side direction and forward. If you press forward plus run, and then left or right, you run diagonally. If you walk forward and then start walking diagonally, and then press run, you run diagonally. If you walk to the side and then press forward and then press run, you run diagonally. But, if you walk to the side and press run before pressing forward, the run command does not register. This also happens if you press run first and then move to the side and then press forward. In both situations, the run command is forgotten, and you're left slowly walking diagonally even though you're holding the run key. It leads to incredibly frustrating moments where you swear you're supposed to be running, but you aren't. Just because you were strafing around before you started trying to run, you can't run. I'd say 20% of my deaths were caused by this bug. Please, please, please fix this. How does something like this go unnoticed three years after the demo came out? So at first I was going to counter this by showing off a bunch of FPS games on PC that do this exact same thing, but as it turns out, most of the games that I tested actually do let you strafe run in the way that Mayo was talking about. The only two games I tested that had the same limitation were Halo Reach and Bioshock Infinite, with Bioshock Infinite actually being more restrictive as you have to go forward, sprint, then side in that order with no deviation. But the other six games I tested, those being Call of Duty World at War, Call of Duty Black Ops 3, Brutal Doom's Tactical Mode, Singularity, Titanfall 2, and Borderlands 2 allow you to diagonally sprint in the way Mayo was describing. Now, I never noticed this while I was playing Trepang 2 since I never tried to diagonally sprint like that, and I honestly wouldn't have noticed if Mayo didn't point it out, but I can agree that this should be fixed. Having said that though, 20% of your deaths were from that. I can understand dying once or twice due to this, but it shouldn't take that long to adjust to the controls as they are. Like, you describe six button permutations to sprint and four of them work. I mean, hell, I had to adjust to the fact that the game doesn't keep you running even if you just tap the run key and instead you have to hold it down at all times. Which is very different compared to most other FPS games I've played on PC, but I was able to adjust to it without too much issue. So you're either lying about that 20% number, or you just seem to have an inability to adapt to the controls as they are. So, on the topic of things feeling confused, I want to discuss the weapon carry number and the modification system. For a game so inspired by fear, and significantly ramping up the action and the number of enemies on screen, and the variety of enemy types, it's baffling to me that they would reduce the weapon number from 3 to 2. 
All right, Mayo, let me explain something. Trepang 2 was inspired by fear, but that doesn't mean that it's trying to copy fear. For example, Infinity Ward is on record stating that the multiplayer in Call of Duty 4 was inspired heavily by Halo 2. But ultimately, the game ended up very different from Halo 2's multiplayer because it's not trying to copy Halo 2. And because of the way Trepang 2 is designed, they felt that a two-weapon limit would be better than a three-weapon limit. And as somebody who has actually played fear, and really enjoys the game, Trepang 2 feels less like fear and more like Wolfenstein The New Order. I simply do not understand this limitation. Three was a good number in fear. Yeah, three was a good number in fear. This isn't fear though, this is Trepang 2. Part of the reason for that was because of how slow and methodical the gameplay was in fear. Charging at the enemies to get up close and personal would often get you killed in that game because of how fast enemies would drain your health. Meaning you couldn't just run out into the middle of a battlefield to pick up a weapon off the ground. As your only real tool to help you play that aggressively in fear was of course the reflex mechanic. Trepang 2 on the other hand is much faster paced because not only is your movement faster, and you still have the reflex mechanic, but you also have a cloak to keep the enemy heat off of you for a couple of seconds. You have a sprint and a slide ability, which you can use to zip and zoom around the battlefield. You can take hostages, which will cause enemies to hold their fire until you start shooting back at them. And then you can throw them towards others like a grenade. Killing enemies will refill your focus meter and temporarily give you infinite stamina. And with all these tools at your disposal, it is far more viable to pick up a weapon off the ground than it is in fear. You could have a shotgun for close encounters, an assault rifle or SMG because they're fun, effective, and versatile and then keep a pistol on you for emergencies, or a sniper rifle, or the penetrator. Combat always felt very expressive because of this. In Trepang 2, only having two weapons severely impacted my enjoyment and experimentation. I mean, I'm not gonna put down this shotgun, it's too good, it's too fun. So I can only pick up one other weapon from the other six or however many there are? Okay, well a shotgun and a DMR pretty much cover my every need. But man, if I could just hold one more weapon, I would at least pull it out here and there out of a sense of curiosity and improvisation. I swear, it is the exact same fucking thing every single time with this man. This is the same shit he pulled with Halo Infinite, it's the same shit he pulled with Ultra Kill, and now he's pulling it with Trepang 2. This argument of, oh, this thing I'm doing is working, so I'm just gonna restrict myself to using nothing but this setup. Don't get me wrong, I love the shotgun in Trepang 2 as well, but sometimes it's better to switch him out for a different gun. Like the grenade launcher, the minigun, the SMG, or hell, even the assault rifle. For example, in the footage he's showing, the only way he's getting consistent headshots with a DMR is by constantly using the focus mechanic, which is a great way to drain it and not have it later when you might need it. While I'm not saying that you can't play this way if you want, in this situation it would be far better to run something like the SMG or the assault rifle since you can more easily get kills with it at the ranges he's engaging the enemies at. Meanwhile, the shotgun might not be the best option for going against an entire horde of enemies at once due to the time it takes to pump the shotgun. But if you had something like dual SMGs or the minigun, you could quickly clear out a group of enemies real quick. It's so bizarre to me that they would do it this way. But a two-weapon limit absolutely can work if it has the systems to support it that push experimentation. Halo is the perfect example. Yeah, you only have two weapons in Halo, but in Halo you run out of ammo on the battlefield and you run around picking up other weapons to improvise with. No, the reason why you run around picking up different weapons in Halo games is because of the different enemy specific weaknesses, as well as weapons that might have advantages in certain situations. Like if you're fighting elites, you're going to want the plasma pistol to take out their shields as well as a precision weapon to finish them off with a headshot. But those weapons aren't particularly effective against the flood, so you might want to trade it out for a shotgun in that case. Maybe you'd have a point with some of the power weapons like the rocket launcher, but for regular weapons like the assault rifle, the pistol, the needler, the plasma pistol, ammo for those weapons are plentiful. The only two exceptions to this are Halo 4 and Halo 5, and in both cases those games are worse off because of it. And the two levels that you show as examples in Halo CE are honestly the two worst examples you could have used to demonstrate this, at least on Legendary. Truth and Reconciliation starts you off with a sniper rifle with about three times the amount of ammo you can normally carry. 
and the level is primarily about trying to use your sniper rifle to the best of its ability and not wasting all of the ammo, rationing it appropriately until you can get to the next ammo cache to restock it. And then you're going to run with either a plasma pistol or a plasma rifle as your secondary weapon to deal with the grunts and jackals. As for the library, the best setup in that level is shotgun and then either the pistol or the rocket launcher. And even then, there's only a handful of rocket launchers throughout the level, so for the most part, you're just going to be running shotgun pistol. Sure, maybe you might breathe pick up the assault rifle to finish off a few infection forms after dealing with the combat forms, but I guarantee you're going to pick up whatever you were carrying normally right afterwards. And yes, this happens in Trepang 2 as well, sometimes, but some of you may remember a little game called Halo Infinite that completely broke the Halo combat loop by 1. allowing you to pick a fully stocked weapon of your choice before every mission, and 2. Most importantly, scattering ammo boxes around the map, allowing you to refill the ammo of your preferred weapon. Now, instead of being pushed into experimentation through ammo limits, you can just run around with the same two guns of your preference the whole time and approach every mission the same way. I never put down the battle rifle because I never had to. I guess people like this kind of player freedom, but I will never understand the appeal. It allows for homogenization of gameplay on a level that's just sad. Ah oh, shit, here we go again. Like I explained in both of my videos talking about Mayo's take on Halo Infinite, having ammo crates in Halo Infinite does not break the core combat loop of Halo. First of all, these ammo crates are separated by type, so you can't get more ammo from the battle rifle if it's a weapon crate for plasma ammo. And number two, Halo has only really used strict ammo counts to balance out power weapons, like the rocket launcher, or the sniper rifle, or the energy sword. And there are only only three places in the entire game that I can think of that have ammo crates for power weapons. One of which is in the main mission where your objective is to take down several phantoms, and those are there simply to make sure you have enough ammo for your rocket launcher and skewer so you can take all of them down. And the other two are in very well hidden places in the open world. Besides that, you're only really going to find ammo crates for regular ass weapons that don't really have a strict ammo count to begin with. Three, not all of the encounters have ammo crates to begin with, or ammo crates of the right type to refill whatever you're carrying. And four, like I explained in the previous segment, the reason you're going to want to switch weapons in Halo is because of different enemy-specific weaknesses. A battle rifle is not going to do you much good against a brute berserker in Halo Infinite, but something like the needler or the shotgun, on the other hand, will probably give you a better chance. And something else that somebody in my comments section pointed out ever since I made those videos, Halo has had stations to restock your ammo ever since Halo CE back in 2001. They were contextualized differently, but you could often find magazines and ammo for UNSC weapons by dead marines, or around other weapon caches in the level. Meanwhile, ammo for Covenant weapons were in these crates. Which is a different way to contextualize them, but ultimately it achieves the same goal. And again, I feel the need to reiterate that this is coming from somebody who regularly plays Halo on Legendary. Trepang 2 does the same thing. You can pick whatever weapons you want before every mission, and every mission is mostly keeping you stocked, whether it's ammo drops in combat, the eventual abundance of weapon boxes, where yes, you can find other weapons to use, but you can just as easily find a full ammo refill for the gun you've been depending on for the past hour, or side mission weapon boxes, where you can use credits to refill guns at any moment, before, after, or even during combat rounds. I wouldn't have as much of a problem with this if you could just hold a third weapon. Keeping my primaries stocked and switching out a third depending on its utility and my own ideas for playing around and experimenting. But only having two weapon slots and allowing me to refill ammo so liberally, it's just Halo Infinite all over again. Alright, now I'm not even sure what you want. On one hand, it seems like you want the game to be more restrictive with its ammo to force you to switch weapons, but at the same time, you're saying you want the game to allow you to hold three weapons, which in turn would give you more ammo, and therefore give you longer to find more ammo for your weapons, which wouldn't push you towards experimentation. No, Trepang 2 gives you plenty of options to experiment in its weapon sandbox, as you just listed, but you're just choosing not to engage with them. And I'm just gonna say that the ammo crates in Trepang 2's main levels aren't as common as ammo boxes in Halo Infinite. Meanwhile, the majority of enemies either carry pistols or SMGs. That's not to say that they won't carry other weapons. 
but it's far less common. For example, the DMR that you love to carry around so much, very few enemies in the game actually carry that. And it doesn't exactly have a lot of ammo, so... What exactly is the issue here? Occasionally, I ended up in situations where I had to throw down my shotgun and pick up a rifle with only 30 bullets, use it up, and then grab something else, and these were some of the best moments I had. They're just so few and far between, because the game seems dead set on making sure I'm as comfortable as possible. And if you had the ability to hold a third weapon, I guarantee there wouldn't be any of those moments in the game. It's so weird, because fear regularly had me in situations where I gotta set down that low ammo penetrator or assault rifle, because picking up a new gun with full ammo is a more advantageous position going forward. Yeah, that's bullshit. Fear keeps you absolutely drowned in ammo for pretty much every weapon, except for like a few special ones like the particle weapon or the rocket launcher. But ammo in that game is absolutely plentiful for every other gun. It's sad to see that kind of design get pushed aside in a spiritual sequel. I'm not saying I didn't have fun or experiment in the sandbox, I did. I like this combat, there's good challenge and excitement to be had, but it certainly isn't as well designed as fear regarding weapon variety incentive. I feel locked into things too often because of these limitations. You feel locked in because the game isn't forcing a gun to your head and telling you what weapons you need to run at any given time? How the fuck does that work? You heard it here first, folks. Having player freedom is too constraining according to Under the Mayo. And it applies to grenades as well. There are six different equipment types. Frag grenades, flashbangs, firebombs, proximity mines, rat bombs, and tomahawks. But in another baffling design decision, you're not allowed to carry more than one type. I can run around with five frag grenades, which is nice, but I'd much rather have access to a smaller number of two or three different equipment types to give myself more dynamic strategy options, like you see in Halo, like you see in The Division, like you see in Resistance Fall of Man, like you see in <gasps> Doom Eternal. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Sure, you can only hold one type of grenade at any given time, but you also forget that you can also grab enemies, prime the grenades that they're carrying, and then throw them at enemies. And given how easily you can do this, that pretty much sidesteps that limitation entirely. For example, if you grab a regular soldier, it'll act like a frag grenade. If you grab a cultist, it'll act like a firebomb, etc. Hell, like in Fear, you could hold three different grenade types in Fear and use any of them at any time. Frag Grenade, Proximity Mine, and Remote Bomb. Why couldn't we have that? I don't know how many times I need to say this, Mayo, but Trepang 2 is not Fear. It is not trying to be Fear, and it doesn't need to copy every single design decision from Fear. I don't understand how the developers didn't think that setting down a proximity mine to cover your exit and then throwing a flashbang into the next room wouldn't create more fun moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Like I explained earlier, there's no backtracking in Trepang 2 with the exception of Site 32 and even then there's no combat during that section. So your exit would be forward on the other side of the arena past all of the enemies anyway. And in most cases, that exit will not open up until you clear out all the enemies in the room anyway. And another part of the problem is the modification system. Whereas Fear's weapons were static, Trepang 2 allows for weapon customization through upgrade parts found in little bits of exploration and completing side missions. Now, I love the connection between side missions and weapon upgrades. Not only are these fun, action-packed, wave-based challenges, but you get something from it that applies to the main campaign. Great. Unfortunately, I think it just contributes to the confusion because when you customize and upgrade a weapon in a video game, is it not because you like that weapon and want to hold on to it? No, when I upgrade a weapon in a video game, it's because I want to improve its ability beyond its base version. Which, funnily enough, in Trepang 2, most of the attachments aren't straight up upgrades as there's often some kind of drawback to taking them. For example, taking the bayonets on the minigun will increase the spread and reduce accuracy, taking the scope on the assault rifle or DMR will reduce the hip fire accuracy, the laser sight improves your accuracy, but it also makes you easier to spot if the enemies either haven't been alerted to your presence yet or if you're using cloak, etc. So it's less of a straight up upgrade and more of just tweaking the weapon's stats to suit your playstyle more. This isn't Borderlands, I can only hold two weapons. 
I've got an incendiary round shotgun that destroys everyone, and a rifle with a laser sight and a 2x scope. I'm shredding over here, and yeah, that grenade launcher is really cool, but after I use it I'm gonna have to remember where I dropped one of my modded weapons and come back to get it. It's a weird position to be in. Or if, say, my incendiary round shotgun runs out of ammo, and there's no shotgun ammo in the next room, normally I'd be okay just dropping the shotgun to use another weapon for a while, and that's fun, but the next shotgun I find isn't going to have the incendiary mod, and I don't want to lose it, so I guess I'll just be running around the next areas with an empty shotgun for a while. Flashback. Occasionally I ended up in situations where I had to throw down my shotgun and pick up a rifle with only 30 bullets, use it up, and then grab something else, and these were some of the best moments I had. They're just so few and far between. So earlier you said you liked it when the game forces you to drop your weapon and pick up something else because it diversifies the gameplay, but now you're saying you don't like it when it does that. Mayo, I think you need to learn how to keep that same energy. And alternatively, instead of remembering where you drop your modded weapon, you can instead just pick up any other version of that weapon and then go to one of the many modding stations around the game, which are even more plentiful than those fucking ammo boxes you like to complain about, and then switch the mods to whatever you want. <laughs> I'd like to replay the game, and I would if it didn't force me to delete my profile. Yeah, no profiles, just the one. How does that make it past the testers to a full release? I like having my completed save because I can replay any level I want, including side missions, and set the difficulty. So what is up guys, it's Thunderstruck115, and today I'm going to show you how you can replay Trepang 2 without deleting your save file. So you're going to want to come over to this table here, hold select mission, you're going to want to select whichever mission you want to replay, which if you want to start from the beginning, that will be Site 14. Click launch mission, select your difficulty, and then you're going to want to make your way over to the helicopter. I know this, this stamina bar makes that such a... Uh, frustrating task, but just bear with me. And then you're going to get to the helicopter, and then you're going to want to board the helicopter, and then you get to replay the game. Anyways, I hope you found this tutorial helpful. I know it's probably very hard, but, you know, I'm sure you can do it. Alright, at this point he just does his outro, so I'm going to go ahead and end the video off here, but if you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe for more, and tell me what you think of Under the Mayo being an absolute clown. Again. Anyways, that's it. Peace!